Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Rick here. Uh, before I get started, I want to uh, remind and encourage you to support our ongoing fundraiser. Uh, the links are in the top of the description box. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Jordan Neely. Uh, there's so much to unpack here. I, I'm not even sure that I'm going to be able to unpack it all in the time that I have because I have a meeting uh, coming up and I need to prepare for it but I needed to talk about this I thought about it I thought about it and it's just so much going on that bothers me um, let's deal with the obvious first um, I want to be very clear here and I, I don't want to put it in a way where I can be accused of race baiting, not because I give a damn about what people think, but because I understand how that impacts what I'm able to do on what platform. Um, and it just is what it is. We don't have the support for the things that our people do to give us our own so that we can go and flow freely. So we're put in situations where we're censored, uh, shut down, suspended, and everything else. So I'm going to uh, be very clear, though. What happened to Jordan Neely was murder. Um, it doesn't take an expert, and this guy was trained, if I'm not mistaken, was a former Marine, so trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, trained in submission holes, trained in understanding what goes on. Uh, you don't have to hold anybody in a chokehold that long. You can choke someone out in 30 seconds. They'll still be alive, but they'll be unconscious and give you time to do whatever you need to do if they're a threat. To hold someone in a chokehold for 15 minutes under any circumstances, uh, to me, shows intent. Uh, there are a lot of people in this world who are just waiting on their moment to see what it feels like. And you know what I'm talking about. And this guy sees that moment. Let me give you some context. Jordan Neely is a guy in New York City who uh, is a Michael Jackson in, uh impersonator who does his routines in the subway stations uh people have seen him people know who he is um but jordan su suffered from uh certain mental health issues and so he was homeless now it's important and it wasn't known at the time but it's important to also understand that Jordan's mother also suffered from mental illness. So this is something we need to also look at before we finish unpacking this. But anyway, he got on the train and he was ranting and raving about how tired he is. And, you know, he, he he's about to go off the deep end or whatever. He's not being aggressive towards anyone. He's not in anyone's space. He's simply being verbally volatile. Now, he is obviously looking at the way he was dressed. It's not hard to look at him and say, okay, he's probably a homeless guy. And many of our homeless population suffer with mental illness. Um, and that's a problem in and of itself. But this guy decides that he's going to subdue this guy and he and another Caucasian guy and a black Caribbean immigrant come together and he holds the guy in a chokehold the Caribbean guy from what I can tell is holding his hand what the fuck that was supposed to do I don't know I'm, I'm gonna comfort you while he kills you basically and trust me that they're going to uh, present the narrative that 
it can't be race because there's a black guy involved. Well, first and foremost, the black guy didn't have him in a chokehold, and the black guy is not uh, foundational American. He is an immigrant, and immigrant black immigrants, depending especially depending on where they're from, have a different perspective and a different view of the system here, and they move in it differently. Uh, and they have a certain opinion and view of black Americans as we have been uh, projected and presented by the media. And so they aren't always our brothers in the sense of camaraderie, connectivity, and they definitely don't have the level of empathy that you would think they would. Now, while I am Pan-African in my... Um, philosophy, I am keenly cognizant of the fact that the African-American experience is a unique experience, and it begins here. Uh, trying to involve and include everyone else will often work against us because no one else has had our experience here. No one else can relate to what happens or what we go through. Everyone has their own experience. And when you are not from here and America is consistently bombarding the world with us being the land of opportunity and this is where you come to fulfill your dreams and you constantly get immigrants who come here and have their dreams underwritten, it is, easily to, it is easy to sell the idea that the reasons blacks that are descendants of slaves don't have anything is because we're lazy. It's because we're naturally criminal minded. It's because we want handouts. It's because we have some form of sense of our, uh, entitlement. If a person doesn't understand the, ca the, the racial caste system under which we operate, if they don't understand and they cannot see uh, the disproportionality and opportunity and access, if they can't see the systemic uh, racial uh, elements and components that we wrestle with com consistently daily, they can buy into this notion that, man, everybody go in there and, and, and even black immigrants will come here and get opportunities that we are not privy to or doors open that we don't necessarily get. And it's systemic, it's, it's systematic, and that's that. But Please don't buy into this narrative that, you know, just because this black dude was sitting there holding his hand, it couldn't have been racism. Uh, I can tell you that if it was a foundational black dude, that white dude wouldn't be sitting there choking that black dude if he was that close. I saw another dude standing in the background in one of the videos, uh, and I'm like, what are we doing? Because I'm going to tell you now, that's not happening with me there. Number one is he didn't bother anybody. And even if he had bothered anybody... That dude wasn't going to be the one to check him. I mean, man, hey, I got this. You back up. You're not finna feel, fulfill your little fantasy on this young brother. And that's all that was. He fulfilled his fantasy. Uh, he was taken in for question. He was released. Now, my thing is, if you, you want to see the system play out, it didn't take any time for them to start pulling up the background on Jordan Neely. Uh, with his run-ins with the law. Well, he's a homeless mental health uh, person, patient. He's going to have run-ins with the law. Hell, non-violent, non-criminal black men have run-ins with the law, especially in New York. You got to remember, this is, this is a city that was doing stop and frisk. Didn't have to have a reason, just stop and frisk until it was ruled unconstitutional. So, run-ins with the, the the law for black men isn't uncommon. So to sit up and say, because I can pull up this, this means he's this. No, he wasn't causing anyone any, any, any harm when he was assaulted. And he was assaulted. He was killed. And that is what we need to do. We need to get this. And here's the other part. We know Jordan Neely. We know his background. We don't even know the other guy's name. He's being protected by the system. Now, we know that if the shoe was on the other foot, and these are just things we know because we've experienced it, we've gone through it enough, and we've seen it. This isn't a complaint. This isn't a whine. This isn't uh, race baiting. This is simply taking our experiences and saying, if there had been a black man choking a white man, 
we would not be having the outcome we have now. Number one, the black man would be charged. Number two, we would definitely know his name. Number uh, number three, the mental health white guy who had been running them up and talking and, 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 and loud and everything. Everybody would have brought up everything that he had to go through as a child and, and everything he's done and all. And he'd have been an angel just having a bad day. Seen it over and over and over again. Um, the media lays out the narrative. That's the reality of it. My thing is, as, as a race of people, we are going to have to reach a point to where we are willing to do what is necessary to ensure that we are safe. They aren't going to protect us. Now, granted, this this guy who choked Jordan Neely to death has had a life of seeing negative images of black men while the same media portrays whites as being superior. So, and I, I, I don't mean superior just in intellect or finance. I mean superior in sense of morality, uh, self-control, and so much more. So it's easy to see yourself protecting the world from this horrible black person. If it's nothing more than to stroke your weak, broken ego. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, it's our responsibility to deal with this. We need to be asking the question, why do we refuse to deal with homelessness? Why do we refuse to deal with mental illness on a grand scale? New York is notorious for its homeless population. I'm from Houston and so are we. Uh, Los Angeles is another one. You know, obviously these uh, big cities are going to have large homeless populations. However, we can't concede to the notion. Now, there are just some people who want to check out. People who don't want to live in the rat race, in the hustle and bustle of nine to fives and mortgages and rents and everything else they've checked out but a lot of them are struggling with mental illnesses a lot of them are struggling with major psychosis and no one is considering this and i say no one i need to be a little clear there are a lot of people out there that are concerned there are organizations that are concerned they don't have the resources <laughs> strong advocate of the homeless community for my own reasons and I have worked with them I stop and I talk to them on a regular basis uh, I do what I can to support and help but this is a huge problem uh, and it is not going to uh, improve by itself it's not going to improve overnight we are going to have to search within ourselves and say what are we going to do we, we, and, and, and we need to take care of home first. We need to look at what we can do for ours because there is a large part of our population struggling with mental illness and with the stigma that's placed on mental illness uh, and seeking help. They're suffering in silence many times until the point they reach a psychotic break or they simply lose sight of in, in a sense of who they are. And... We end up with situations like this. Uh, we end up with them in the uh, penal system when they truly need to have help. We need to be aware of our responsibility. And I think one of the things that has happened with us as a people is that we have become so consumed in our personal egos uh, the need to serve self, the need to take care of self, the need to look out for me, to do what I want to do. 
I'm not going to say anything about what you do. That's your business. Why? Because I don't want you to say anything about what I do. So nobody's holding anybody accountable. Nobody's setting a standard of performance. Nobody's setting a standard of care. And so everybody's fending for themselves and everybody's doing whatever they got to do to make it. And so no one has the time to care about anybody else. We're going to lose ourselves as a people if we don't embrace the responsibility to stand up, step up, and make some things happen in our community. I've been talking about the 75,000 plus missing black women in America, human trafficking. I've been talking about intimate partner violence, intimate partner uh, homicide. I've been talking about mental illness in the black man. I've been talking about mass incarceration and, and what that's doing. I've been talking about African-American, adolescent, and young, young adult male violence. I've been talking about our inability to close the wealth gap. I've been talking about these things because I've spent my life studying them. And I see that we need to address them directly. Sitting on the sidelines complaining is not a solution. It's not a plan. And it's not a strategy. It is our responsibility to sit down and come up with solutions. I've spent years writing solutions. I've spent years consulting some of the most brilliant minds uh, in, in, in the black community um, to create the Blueprint 1.0, which is on the Odyssey Project site, by the way. I have worked hard to create Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage initiative which helps guide young black men into black manhood. And it reduces uh, their proclivity for violence. It reduces their risk for incarceration. It increases their likelihood to start and sustain a family and more. I've worked on uh, helping women with domestic violence, uh, worked on helping women uh, abused as children. I still literally have people on my schedule in my calendar. This is a grand work. It doesn't make me a hero or make me special or anything like, but it's a grand work. When I say a grand work, I don't mean I'm grand. I mean the work is grand. It's it's huge. It's large. It has a strong demand. It takes a lot out of you. But it's necessary. And you can either sit up and you can look at what's needed in our community and you can sit up and say, you know what? That's too much for me. And you can walk away or you can sit up and say, I'm going to commit to it. I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm going to be a part of the solution. And that's going to happen in, in, in every area and aspect of life, no matter what you choose to do. You're going to constantly be met with a decision, a choice of making a difference or ri simply riding along the trend and allowing things to happen. I choose to be a difference maker. I choose to be engaged. And why I can't make a difference on a scale that I would like I choose to still be involved. I, st I choose to still go one step at a time, each minute, each second, uh, each hour, and I will consistently and continually do that until I breathe my last breath. My challenge is we can't consistently and continuously go on losing black men, losing black women, losing black children. Our children are committing suicide, in case you didn't know. I've been talking about that, but nobody's listening. We need to develop programs. Outside of the programs I've already developed, we need more research. Outside of the thousands upon thousands of hours of research I've already conducted, and we've conducted at the Odyssey Project uh, Research Center, we can't be serious about winning and empowerment when they are out researching us about us so that they can manipulate us. They have four more resources invested in understanding what moves us, how to manage us, how to mislead us. All of these things are consistent uh, from the disproportionality of special education referrals on down the line. There's just so many different things that I've talked about. Uh, I have pointed you to uh, I have been a resource and advocate for, and we are going to have to do better. My prayers go out to this young man's family. 
I am hoping that we as a people decide that this isn't the end of the story and that we rise up and in an organized and aimed and targeted way respond to it. Picket signs aren't the answer. We need a strategic agenda of how we're going to use our money as a weapon. How we're going to use uh, business ownership. How we're going to start educating our children. How we're going to fund mental health programs. How we're going to define manhood, which is under assault. Black manhood, black masculinity is under a major assault. And there's a reason for that, and I've explained it. I've talked about it in books. I've lectured on it. We are going to have to do something different. It's that simple. Um, I got to get off and prepare for this meeting, but I definitely am challenging my people whom I love to wake up from our, our stupor and our, our slumber and understand that some things need to change, that we need to be actively engaged in answering some of these problems. Yeah, we can be upset about what happened to Jordan Neely, but we also need to be aware of some of the dynamics that were in play that led to this. He, didn't, he did not deserve to be killed. He was murdered. Uh, I don't care what they say, he was murdered, but what was his help before that? Because one of his complaints on that was he was tired. And honestly, I can understand and I can relate to that. So there's work to be done. Um, I've been talking heavily this week about um, the black women missing. We need to address that. We need to address... Um, the missing black man, 1.3 of that 1.5 million are incarcerated. We make up 6% of the pop population, a general population, but we make up 40% of the prison population. Uh, and it would lead you to believe that we are simply naturally criminal minded, but we don't look at the social constructs, the social engineering, the things that push us towards that. Um, and we don't take responsibility for creating avenues and paths and resolutions and solutions to these enigmas and problems. That's on us. That's on us. So I'm going to get out of here. Uh, may God bless that man's family. Jordan Neely, uh, rest in peace, young brother. Um, and to whoever this guy is who goes unnamed right now, uh, he needs to be brought to justice. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm, I want to encourage you to support the work we do at the Odyssey Project through our fundraiser, ongoing fundraiser. Uh, the link and information of how you can give is at the top of the description box or post box, depending on where you're watching it. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have uh, a good remainder of your of your day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here Dropping in with a little special announcement For those who have followed me for any stretch of time You know outside of the businesses that I run Like Myriad Business Solutions The Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, In Houston, Dallas and other areas uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. 
uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.